much for coming. You have managed to arrive in sufficient numbers to exactly fill the seats that we laid out, uh, which, is, which is terrific. Thank you. Uh, those of you from outside UCL, uh, welcome. Uh, those of you uh, from inside UCL, welcome as well. This is, this is new to uh, most of you, new to uh, all of us even. This is um, the launch event, among other things, for the UCL Hub for Responsible Research and Innovation. Um, which, uh, as, it, as its first pro uh, project, um, has the RRI Tools project. This is why you can see the, the banners there for just behind our guest lecturer. Um, the RRI Tools uh, to develop a toolkit for responsible innovation, which slightly suggests that we know what we're talking about when we say responsible innovation or responsible research and innovation. And I think that's maybe a little bit premature. Um, part of the aim of the Hub for Responsible Research and Innovation at UCL is to work out what this means as an agenda. This is uh, a new terminology uh, in science and technology policy, but it is dealing with a perennial set of issues, concerns, <coughs> questions. Um, our aim as researchers, those of us in the science and technology studies department, is to ask those empirical questions about why responsible research and innovation, what it means, who should be involved, when should it take place, that sort of thing. But also, we have an explicitly uh, practical aim, which is to get out into the university and beyond and start thinking about what responsible research and innovation means in practice, um, which is what the toolkit is all about, and our hope is that the hub will be the base for exactly those forms of experimental uh, collaboration. With that in mind, um, we couldn't hope for a better guest lecturer tonight than Richard Jones, who I have been uh, lucky enough to uh, experimentally collaborate with over, over the years. Um, those of you that don't know him, he is uh, not just one of the UK's leading nanoscientists with all sorts of uh, convenient and important positions at the centre of British Science Policy um, at uh, the Royal Society, EPSRC, as uh, PVC at Sheffield. Um, but he is also one of uh, the country's most thoughtful commentators on the questions of science, technology and society uh, that Responsible Innovation uh, seeks to advance as an agenda. So please, everybody, join me in welcoming Richard tonight and we look forward to hearing his uh, answer. Is it going to be an answer or just... The question, <laughs> can innovation ever be responsible? Is it ever irresponsible not to innovate? Good, well thanks very much. It's a huge pleasure to, to come to UCL to, to, uh, to, to this uh, launch of this important centre. Uh, as Jack says, I've, been, uh, I've, I've known Jack for some time uh, as a natural scientist. Uh, I, I, it's really true. Jacks, one of the people who started me thinking about these issues in ways that I hadn't thought of before as a, as a natural scientist. And I guess it's um, where those thoughts have taken me. I wait to see whether Jack still approves of where, where that's gone. So I really want to, uh, I, I have two questions. I asked uh, Jack if I could have both two questions because what I want to talk about is essential, an essential dichotomy in the way that we're talking about innovation at the moment. There are really two quite different narratives and uh, that seem very much in tension. On the one hand, uh, uh, um, we have this very familiar idea that technolo technological innovation is accelerating. So on the one hand, we see this in you know, our, our everyday lives about how, uh, how frequently we have, we have to update our smartphones. But you know, at the limit, and uh, you know, extreme positions are often interesting for, for, uh, as illustrations sort of uh, more widely held views. We have a bunch of people who believe in a technological singularity. We have a bunch of people thinking that uh, uh, the, the pace of innovation is accelerating so fast that in uh, 2046, if I remember correctly, Greg Hertzfeld's view. Uh, we will proceed into some completely unknowable future where we have all uploaded ourselves onto our iPads and uh, live in a kind of new digital world. So there, in a sense, the, 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 the 
the underlying message of that for the pessimist would be that the pace of innovation is beyond society's ability to control it. And so from this perspective, responsible innovation might be thought of as, you know, how can you deal with this ever-accelerating pace of innovation? But on the other hand, I guess since 2008, since the financial crisis, we've had another kind of uh, uh, discourse about innovation. So this is Tyler Cohen's book, the economist Tyler Cohen, who wrote a book called The Great Stagnation, uh, which really argues, contrary to the former, that <coughs> technological innovation is slowing down. And in this case, uh, uh, there are, of course, different views about what people mean so, uh, secular stagnation, but the idea that the, the slowing pace of innovation is part of the current the difficulties that uh, the developed countries are now in is technically part of this. So, kind of to state the obvious, both of these kind of things can't be true, or they can't always be true about everything. So, uh, through this talk, I want to kind of uh, explore the two parts of this problem. So, what... Okay, I'm going to start. Let, let me not try and define what responsible innovation is, but start by talking about what we might think irresponsible innovation looks like. So I think we all have a kind of intuitive picture of what irresponsible innovation looks like. Uh, there's uh, uh, the, uh, my, my classic uh, scientist. Uh, this uh, um, depiction of, a, uh, of the scientist in his uh, dungeon laboratory, uh, the author of that great journal, the Beano. So I just want to point out here that uh, this, that this scientist actually is rather reflective as he can open appreciates that uh, people may um, uh, think that his uh, mad maniac or what is uh, absolutely uh, uh, off-putting. Anyway, I won't go into the people, that, the people who uh, subscribe or know about the crime and new monster story where there's an ape in the monster and that's how we jump on the insatiable desire for sausages. It's uh, an enormously old cultural trope. So, uh, you know, we, we just see this right through popular culture ever since the, uh, uh, Mary Shelley. And here's a, perhaps another example, which is not totally unrelated. And I said, this is where I came into this story. So, in, uh, um, uh, um, 15 years ago or so, I was thinking quite hard about what people would mean by a radical nanotechnology. And then we had this intervention from uh, a, a very respected science policy commentator, Prince Charles, who uh, are, who are the scientists to look into great and good. So here we are, 2003 this was. So fears by the Prince of Wales that armies of microscopic robots could turn the face of the planet into an uninhabitable wasteland have prompted the, the nation's top scientists and engineers to launch an inquiry. Uh, so that, that, that duly happened. There's not enough to point out about this. So the idea here was that you know, nanotechnology would lead to these exponentially uh, self-replicating uh, nanobots which would consume the entire biosphere. And I suppose uh, at this point we'd probably want to agree that this is not entirely desirable as an outcome. So uh, it, uh, I don't think it would be stretching a point to accuse the scientists of doing this of being uh, uh, irresponsible. But I guess the more interesting question about this, well, a couple of interesting questions. One's actually a rather interesting technical question about you know, how likely is it that this outcome will happen. My view, which is I, I can explain at great length and in some technical detail, is that this is not a very, not very likely outcome. But I guess the question I'm left with is, OK, if it's really so unlikely, um, and, and people still talk about this, you know, they're, they're, uh, one still reads uh, uh, discussions about this as you know, a potential existential risk, so, uh, actually, what purposes are served by this kind of existential risk diet discourse, this kind of very extreme speculative uh, uh, discussion about uh, what, what might be, uh, look like a very uh, remote possibility? And I'll actually come back to that later in the talk. Well, just to whiz through some more yeah. potential examples of uh, irresponsible innovation, uh, here's another one that's in the news. The US, uh, 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 a week or two ago, uh, suspended uh, gain-of-function studies. So gain-of-function studies for viruses means you, uh, you, you get a, a pathogenic virus and you uh, tinker with its, uh, 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 with its genetic code to make it more pathogenic. And so this reminds us that uh, uh, genetic modification, synthetic biology, these are techniques that do 
genuinely have the potential to do things like make pathogens more, more dangerous, to recreate historical pathogenic strains or create entirely new pathogens once the people are a bit further around. So here, already legitimate grounds for research in these areas. So in a sense, this is already not quite a black and white issue, but certainly there's cause for concern. Then, uh, to come to some other examples, here's one that I put in for, for, for Jack. Geoengineering, of course, is a, a very uh, a, a potentially controversial issue. So the idea here is to modify, to, to overcome climate change by mod modifying the incoming solar radiation. Uh, and uh, again, you can, uh, at this point, you can start constructing arguments on either side. There, there's, uh, uh, there's this idea uh, 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 of opposing it. There's the opportunity cost of doing this rather than taking some other steps to, to mitigate climate change. There's a slightly very powerful idea of moral hazard uh, that uh, uh, this kind of amelioration stops you taking responsibility for doing what you And if push came to shove and you really needed it, uh, wouldn't we be pleased if we'd done the research that were prepared already? So, uh, this is a, a, an area in which the idea of responsible uh, uh, innovation actually already had some, uh, has had some impact. EPSRC uh, had uh, supported a, a, a project to, to, to look into it, but it's uh, a uh, long and complicated story that I can't even remember, even though it's too long for me to go into. Uh, uh, that, that, that project had a very interesting um, outcome in terms of uh, being uh, suspended uh, while uh, more work was done to, uh, to, to, to explain its goals and talk to NGOs and, and, and the public. creating methane leakage, uh, environmental and water effects. In a sense, I suppose what we can say about this is that this is an innovation that sort of happened and it took off before any kind of discussions about responsible innovation really uh, uh, gained any traction. That may not be the case in, in, the case in this country. And then my final example, just to get, get us in the mood for what responsible or irresponsible innovation might look like, is this one. So Wonga, as we know, is a, 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 a company that uh, uh, was created to do short-term loans, payday loans, uh, and uh, I just remind people that this is you know, 2009, when it was set up, this was regarded as a really shining example of British digital innovation. It's a company that had a lot of technology, harnessing technology to create a faster, slicker, more foolproof service, so an online service that you could access for loans 24 hours a day, and you know, having applied for one of these loans, it would, so the money would be in your bank account in a couple of hours, no matter what time of day or night it was. Uh, and this kind of big data thing of using lots of personal data to construct a, a, a credit history. And of course, this has been in the news much more recently in a much more negative way. Uh, in, uh, so here, uh, earlier uh, last month, had to write off 220 million pounds of loans uh, as a result of a ruling by the, the, the FCA. Uh, because it had uh, used this technology, this technology had ended up uh, issuing debt or, or lending money to people who had no chance of being able to repay it. So I guess I, I just want to say a few inter I think the interesting things about that example, maybe not one that you would think of thinking about innovation in an academic context because it's mostly not taking place in an academic context. It's of course entirely a private sector operation. Uh, the innovation is essentially as much social as it is technical, but nonetheless, the technical underpinnings are already in place. So um, it, it, it's built on a kind of superstructure, a substructure of technical innovation that's already been done. And that's a mixture of stuff that's funded by the state, but stuff that's done through open source, commercial innovation. All those ingredients went in to make the platform that Wonga could do to, go, uh, to, to, to make their business. 
So it probably wasn't foreseen. Well, I don't know. So was this foreseen or not? Could you have uh, could, could some of the, 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 the people who were involved in those technical underpinnings have realised whether this would happen or not? Maybe not. I mean, I do have this, uh, you know, essentially pornography of gambling and loan sharking are the kind of classic triad of things that always take advantage of new technologies, so maybe one should have thought that that was, that was coming. Uh, but the way it was, so, so in a sense it was controlled, so there was a sense in which the innovation was controlled, but it was after the event. So it was controlled by, uh, by, by a regulation after, after the event. And of course, finally, I'd say for those uh, who think that responsibility is a good word, of course, in this sector, in the tech sector, as understood in, uh, you know, as being essentially ICT, this idea of disruption is regarded as being you know, a positive virtue. Right? So you know, nobody kind of makes an you know, attack this tech sector by saying, oh, we're going to do a responsible innovation. In sense, there's that the whole language about that sector is all about, come, let's find some market opportunity and completely disrupt it. So, uh, those are, uh, I, I just, to get us in the frame of mind of thinking about what irresponsible innovation might look like, or you know, where the arguable cases are. I suppose you know, one response to this is to ask, you know, if innovation produces so many um, different, um, uh, so, so many potential downsides, perhaps you should either just kind of radically slow innovation down or just not innovate at all. And I suppose um, it's a very kind of eloquent um, discussion of this idea in Bill McKibben's book, Enough. And I suppose this title, Enough, suggests, you know, we already have enough technology. Technology may not be distributed in, in the correct way, so perhaps if we more fairly distributed the fruits of the technology that we had, uh, that would be fine. And then, you know, on, on that basis, the new technologies, particularly things like GM and nanotechnology that seem particularly potentially disruptive and pervasive, uh, you know, we should just not do them, we should just uh, endure them and think. So I think this is, uh, this is an argument that worth, that's worth thinking about, at least to say why, uh, um, um, why we, we, we would accept it. And I suppose I have a very strong opposing view, uh, and, sorry, uh, and I would say that this is not an acceptable position. And the reason it's not an acceptable position is this. We are existentially dependent on technology, and it's also clear that the technologies that we depend on are not sustainable. So, in that sense, I think the option of saying we'll just sit back and live with the technologies we've got will not work. I've got one illustration of that, or one, you know, one, uh, one, one example of that that I really want to concentrate on. It's these two figures, these two figures who I think have a serious claim to be the most important people in the 20th century. So my slight audience participation spot. How many people know who those are? No. It's uh, Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch. So Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch, of course, uh, responsible for the, the Haber-Bosch process invented in Germany in, uh, in, in, in the war, in the first World War. So just a, a little bit less than 100 years ago. My, I, I argue, you know, this is, I, I think, the <coughs> A is why the technologies that we have are both things that we absolutely existentially depend on and ones that we can't continue with. So, uh, between 1900 and 1990, the total amount of land uh, brought into cultivation increased by 30%, but the amount of energy that was put into that land, the energy inputs, into the land from artificial fertilizers, also mechanical farming influence, mechanization of farming, that increased by a factor of more than 80 fold. So between 1900 and 1990, our food economy was completely transformed. It went from being you know, essentially organic, essentially uh, driven by the, the, the sun in terms of its energy inputs, into one that uh, it was essentially oil based. And so you can see this, this is a curve of wheat yields as a function of time, showing the yields flatten around about a ton per hectare in countries like France. You see that massive rise, a little bit of a delay uh, while this mechanization got going, 
but from 1940 or so, you see that massive rise in, 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 in wheat yields up to uh, six, seven, uh, eight, eight tons per hectare. That is driven by energy inputs from fossil fuels. So it's not an exaggeration to say we essentially eat oil at the moment. So a ton of winter wheat uh, has in it about 20 kilograms of fixed nitrogen, and that 20 kilograms of fixed nitrogen has got about 6.7 tons of oil. So it's really not an exaggeration to say that uh, you know, essentially we eat oil, and without this harbour wash fixed nitrogen, uh, more than half the world's population would starve. Or to put it another way, if, uh, uh, the, the reason why the world's population is the, 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 the number it is, is entirely because of the, the harbour wash process. So that's uh, just, I think, the most graphic example of why the new technologies of the 20th century are things that we utterly existentially depend on. And of course, the consequences of that are very clear. What, what, where, what happened when we burnt all that oil? Well, it uh, made the carbon dioxide concentration go up from its historical value of about 280 parts per million to its current value, which is uh, you know, more than 400. Uh, and of course, what did burning as much of that carbon dioxide do? It made the planet hotter. So there is no question that we depend utterly on fossil fuels, and that fossil fuel dependence grows. And uh, so, so these are plots uh, for, uh, which show both uh, what we use, uh, where the oil is, uh, where, where, where energy is used, what it's used for, but particularly where it comes from. Oil, gas, coal, tiny bit of nuclear, a little bit of hydro, and a little sliver of renewables. And in that context, renewables is largely actually biomass. So much as I love, as a nanotechnologist, I love solar energy, and you know, part of my work as a natural scientist is developing uh, new forms of, uh, of, of, of photovoltaic uh, devices, uh, I look at these numbers and I play it. And so, you know, it's very easy to get hung up, or, or it's very easy to get overwhelmed with technological optimism that we're on the, 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 the edge of, uh, uh, of changing all this, but it's really difficult to see that. So this, this projection goes out to 2030, and it's difficult to see it doing anything other than that gigantic slab of fossil fuel use massively increasing. The drivers for that are quite clear. There, uh, it's increasing population, it's uh, the, the, the spread of uh, 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 the kind of increasing wealth in mono-ECD countries, in the formerly uh, less developed countries, and that leads to this, uh, this uh, apparently unstoppable rise in energy dependence. And so the future then is very clear. Um, and here's some you know, projections from the IPCC. So I've got a, um, the, the, what happens depends on uh, what happens to temperature. It depends on uh, what we do about the, 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 the energy growth and energy use and the, the use of uh, fossil fuel energy. And um, the only our only hope, if you like, of stabilizing this, you know, a huge, huge amount of this stuff is baked in already. The, the only hope of stabilizing the 2050 is this scenario here. Rapid change in economic structures, material reductions in material intensity, clean and resource efficient technologies. So this is all about new technologies of some kind or another. So that's really my uh, a little passage explaining why I think you know, the option of just saying we'll just kind of calm down and just stop this innovation stuff really isn't tenable. So what do we mean by responsible innovation? Well, I think uh, it's, uh, I think it's really quite straightforward. It's, uh, it's a question of, you know, how do you steer the development of science and technology so that it meets, so, so it meets widely shared societal goals? And I think if I was asked for a definition of it, I would give something like that. And I think I would just observe that this, of course, is not a new, not a new idea. It's a very old idea. And I think, essentially, every generation of, uh, of needs to come to this and needs to re-examine this idea in the context of the science and innovation policy that, that, that it currently has. 
So it's fascinating to go back and read books like, you know, The Social Function of Science by J.D. Grinnell, which is a, a, a really fascinating book written about 1940 in the late 30s, which, you know, in a sense addresses many of these issues, but in the social and, uh, context of the time. And of course, at the risk of sounding nostalgic, I was looking through my bookshelves the other day and I found a little pamphlet wedged between two books, which was uh, what, 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 what a concerned physics student wrote about in 1981. There it was, there's, the, 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 there's my little booklet for the British Society of Social Responsibility and Science, and I, I well remember <coughs> this whole meeting in the back room in the, in, in the Eagle in, in Cambridge. So what, do we, what, what were we worried about? We were worried about automation, so uh, 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 having heard the Industrial Revolution is over, we won. Uh, what made us optimistic? We had the, you know, things like the Lucas Plan, we all had our Lucas Plan books. Uh, you know, how could you uh, really, uh, uh, shift away uh, production from, um, from, from arms to socially useful things? But I think I suppose the one thing, I do look back on those times and I, it really strikes me with a great thud, really. It's what I did worry about, being blown up. I mean, that sense of, um, uh, you know, as a, uh, and I was brought up, I should say, to personal notes on this, I was brought up as an Air Force child, you know, I knew the difference between the sound of an A-10 and an F-11. And, you know, you just hear those things in, the, in East Anglian skies and really want to worry what's going to happen. So, just for however terrible things are now, that's one thing that, well, maybe we should worry about it a bit more than we do, but it's not quite the other person. So responsible innovation now, well, where are we with that? Well, responsible innovation is now, it's a term of art in science policy discourse, and uh, we've got that. So uh, in the very nice work that Jack did with Richard Owen and Phil Norton for, for EPSRC, we have this actually rather elegant, <coughs> succinct definition. It's a commitment to care for the future through collective stewardship of science and innovation in the present. Uh, René von Schomburg, in, uh, 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 for the EU framework program, wrote this much more wordy paragraph, which uh, um, uh, it's a transparent interactive process by which societal actors and innovators become mutually responsive to each other with a view to the ethical acceptability, sustainability, societal desirability of the innovation process, and its logical products in order to allow a proper embedding of scientific and technological advances in our society. And indeed, I, mean, I think what I think that's a much less snappy definition than, than Jack, so I'll leave the Jack there, but Granny did produce these very rather nice four signatures of irresponsible innovation, asking this question of you know, what, what sort of thing to be irresponsible, uh, things that are based entirely on technology push, uh, neglecting fundamental ethical principles, get the example of the patient records in the Netherlands, uh, this sort of idea of policy call, the need to be seen to, be, to, to do something, leading it to uh, the idea of security theatre, and um, uh, <coughs> lack of precautionary measures and uh, a, a lack of uh, technology foresight. So there we have, you know, classic examples like asbestos, hormones as growth promoters. So uh, that. And I'm sure this afternoon you've been talking in enormous detail about uh, uh, what uh, this, what, what, what we mean by responsible innovation in this context of science policy in our current science policy environment. A big ingredient in this, of course, has been public engagement. Uh, if we're talking about, uh, you know, how do we uh, align our innovation with widely held societal views, how do we know what people think, you know, how do we know whether the goals of innovation are widely shared in society? And I think there are a number of answers to that. So we could, we, uh, a number of different answers. The first answer actually is that uh, you should say when you should leave it to, to ministers, and that's the point about having a democratic government. So that uh, mechanisms of representative democracy are sufficient to uh, align innovation with, um, uh, uh, with uh, with the widely held needs of society. Now I said that completely with a straight face, so that's fine. Um, um, a much more serious part of the question, that I'm going to spend a bit of time on, uh, would be to say that actually the market is the correct mechanism for doing this. That, that it's the mechanisms of the market 
is the way of aggregating that, 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 that information. And I'll, I'll come back to that because I think it's a really important critique. And uh, it's absolutely central to understand what the reports are. But then uh, the, the third idea would be through the direct engagement of the public or the different publics in deliberative processes uh, to talk about technology in a reflexive way. And of course, there's a, a history here. We've seen this idea of, of, of the rise of upstream of engagement, the understanding of science movements, often dated to the Bodmer Report in 1985, uh, and this, of course, uh, being critiqued by uh, uh, social scientists like Brian Wynne as being essentially a deficit model. And um, that critique was very elegantly uh, put into um, in a rather influential document from Demos that uh, James Wilson was uh, responsible for to talk about how uh, the engagement should, could, could really help uh, uh, um, align, do, do this job of aligning the relation with societal wants and needs. And essentially this was the, the environment in which I learned about uh, I, I, started uh, uh, engaging with these issues. Uh, to go back to uh, my Prince Charles, Prince Charles in 2003, actually Prince Charles always maintains he ne never said anything about Grey Goo, that was all just kind of the, the wild imaginations of the Daily Telegraph. But nonetheless, the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering did report on nanotechnology. But it was, a, I think, a very interesting and important report, but not least because the working group, uh, unusually for the Royal Society, didn't just include scientists and engineers, but it had social scientists and philosophers, as well as representatives of NGOs. And that produced this, um, um, this recommendation that a constructive and proactive debate about the future of nanotechnologies should be undertaken now at a stage when it can inform key decisions about their development and before deeply entrenched in the hierarchy of the field. So this really was, I think, a, 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 an example of uh, a very um, explicit attempt to um, incorporate this idea of upstream engagement. And it's worth asking a question, well, what were, what were people thinking when they did that? What problem was public engagement trying to solve in that case? I think, you know, the first, uh, the most obvious one was that, uh, uh, that I think many people feared and I say an anticipatory backlash because you can't have a backlash against a technology that hasn't arrived. But uh, the, 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 the worry was there's this new technology coming along and the, the, the public would reject it. And so in a sense, this is a, a set of motivations that are not so different from the ideas that were critiqued by Brian Wing in terms of the deficit model. But nonetheless, this was the background. We have the shadow of GM as uh, people who are in favor of uh, Approaches uh, was hanging over it. The, this idea of grey goo, you can't deny it was it, it, it was an important thing in, project, in, in getting us into the, into the public uh, domain. And there was this very serious and uh, real, I think a serious and, actually let me put that another way, the, 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 the problem that was very real, but not necessarily enormously wide ranging, of nanoparticle toxicity and uh, Example of asbestos explaining that section of the So, in a sense, that was, if you like, that's what kind of the, the great and good of the scientific world, I think, thought that they could use public engagement for. But I think there were some secondary ideas. We, uh, I think, uh, as this went on, I think it, it was clear that actually, if you were going to do this, the reason to do it would be not just to, to try and anticipate a backlash, but actually because it might make you help you make sounder decisions. This is a very highly interdisciplinary science that was very explicitly linked to societal goals. And in this case it was felt, or I say it was felt, I felt, I and a number of other people felt that this would actually be positively helpful in, uh, in, in, in kind of making the decisions that you need to make about what directions to, 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 to make science. And there's a little bit of, you know, the um, we, we have seen a very uh, kind of perceived marketization of public 
science. And in a sense, uh, there's another side of this argument, which is that by uh, uh, engaging with the public, you kind of stress the public value of science as opposed to its, uh, its potential market value. So I think, uh, uh, as I, I, I look back on this, this episode, I think it's quite helpful in crystallizing some of the ideas that have gone into uh, the, the, the broader idea of response to innovation. I think we had some small victories. Uh, this is my first experience of this was actually in 2005. There's a citizen's jury in Halifax that I spent uh, several evenings going up to a slightly dismal community centre in inner city Halifax, which was actually very important and educational for me. So we had a, a very a wide variety of public engagement processes around nanotechnology. Jack was involved in some of them, that really run by lots of people, but by NGOs, so uh, had, uh, Greenpeace was involved in one, which did one that I was involved in, uh, government involved some, research councils uh, uh, explicitly uh, commissioned uh, uh, at least one of these. And looking back on this, what do I think this did for us? Well, I think it did influence funding policy, so we can make directly point to decisions that research councils made that would have been different had there not been uh, public engagement. And moreover, I would maintain that those decisions were actually better decisions than, than, than would have been made without it. I don't know, maybe it led to a richer public dialogue. It's a bit difficult to, to do that without trying to counter that all. But I think the one thing it did do, and I think this is a, a, an interesting point, one of the kind of criticisms, so the citizens jury had you know, 15 or 20 people on it, and one of the criticisms that uh, people particularly <coughs> keen on kind of quantitative social sciences tend to make is, well, you have a citizen's jury with 20 people, and how can this be at all representative? How can this in any way be representative of the population at large? And how could this be helpful? You know, this is kind of retail engagement. You need to do it wholesale to be able to reach enough people to kind of influence a debate. And actually, they, they, those are both arguments that, that, that are not without force. But the one thing I would say is actually, Although, you know, what fraction of the population of the UK were engaged in, in public engagement events about nanotechnology? Well, I know, maybe 200 were out of, you know, 60 million, which is not a very big fraction. What proportion of UK nanoscientists were engaged in public engagement events? Actually, quite a lot. And actually, I think it did make a big difference in developing a bunch of scientists who really were more reflective and more socially engaged. Anyway, so that's my attempt to, uh, uh, to, to, to justify uh, all that time I spent in those years doing that stuff. So let's talk about why response and innovation might be difficult. Well, fundamentally, it's difficult for this reason, because we don't know what the future is. And uh, the answer to the question, the question in a sense we're asking is, can we be responsible in the way that we think about the future? I think there are four possible answers to this. Uh, well, now, no, there's two possible answers, yes and no, uh, but there are four different reasons why, like, why you might have those answers. I think um, one bunch of people, people who are essentially technological determinists, would say, no, you can't do this because the future is essentially preordained. So this idea that technology is an autonomous force with its own internal logic, it's a kind of West Coast Californian idea, if you read the book, um, um, you know, this is the wired view of the world, if you like, that, this, that the technology has just unfolded with its own unstoppable logic, and there's nothing you can do about it. And the other view, of course, is actually the Hayekian view, which is actually a more interesting one, which just says, look, there are you know, the future is radically unknowable. And so, we can't really um, uh, think about that. Of course, there, 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 there's uh, one uh, answer to yes, so if I go back to J.D. Bernal, the kind of Bernal answer to this question is, uh, yes, we can be responsible about the way we can think about the future because we can rationally plan the outcomes we desire. So if you're a kind of state planner, then uh, this all makes total sense. So the position of uh, responsible innovators is a more nuanced version of yes. It's yes because we can reflexively adjust the process of innovation as it happens to 
through this process of anticipation, reflection, and inclusive deliberation. So, so that, that's the, the, the kind of positive view. Now, the most stark statement of the, uh, the, the negative view comes from uh, uh, Colin Rich, who expressed this dilemma beautifully. Colin Rich's control dilemma is this. He argued, when a technology is young enough to influence its future trajectory, you can't know where it will lead, so there's nothing you can do about it. And then when a technology is mature enough for you to have a good idea of its consequences, it's too late to change it. It's not good. This, I, I, you know, I think this argument has a huge amount of force. It's a very pessimistic conclusion. Basically, you know, if we take this at face value, we should all just go home and just let things unfold. I think the, mess, the, the, the lesson I would try and take from it is a slightly more positive one, or, or it kind of puts an onus on us as people who think about innovation to think much more seriously about the process by which innovation happens, not just how you know, inventions happen in the lab, but how they are taken to market and all the processes by which uh, technologies get locked in. Now I come back to Hayek. This critique, the most forceful critique of this, really comes from, 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 uh, from Hayek. I'd, I'd put it this way. The argument here would be, okay, basic science is a resource that innovators can apply in ways which are unpredicted and unpredictable by the sciences, uh, by, by originators. So um, we have a bunch of scientists who do things because they're interested in them, and uh, the outcomes of those are, are, look, uh, are taken by middle men, middle entrepreneurs. It's entrepreneurs that make innovations and test them in the market. And in this view, it's the market that is the only way of assessing uh, whether innovation is societally desirable. So my understanding of uh, you know, my reading of Hayek is that you know, what's the really important point that Hayek makes about the market, <coughs> the really powerful point, is you know, the market is a device for aggregating information. It's a, it's a, so it, you know, it, it answers the question, how do we know what 60 million people are thinking about something Without actually kind of making them um, well, they they vote by what they buy, and so that, that, that the idea is that it, it's really information is aggregated by markets. And so the, and the related view of this, the related thought from this, came from Hayek's friend Michael Blaney, who, who launched this idea of of the independent republic of science. So he wrote in 1962, the pursuit of science by independent self-coordinated initiatives assures the most efficient possible organization of scientific progress. And we may add again that any authority which would undertake to direct the work of the scientists centrally would bring the process of science, progress of science, virtually to a standstill. You can kill or mutilate the advance of science, you cannot shape it, for it can advance only by essential unpredictable steps pursuing problems of its own. And the practical benefits of these advances will be incidental and hence doubly unpredictable. So again, this is this radical unknowability that comes out of the high end.
was a tourist and offer. And here I kind of refer to Henry Ford, who's famous dictum. If I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said hard parts of horses. So this brings us, I think, to a really serious thinking about the economics of innovation and how innovation actually happens in the market. Uh, classical economics, of course, tells us that it's hard for an innovator to capture the full value of the societal value of uh, innovation. Uh, so in the neoliberal economic policy, we recognize this as a market failure, and we attempt to correct it through supply-side measures, intellectual property law, essentially giving monopolies, support for basic science and power and tax credits. What I want to point out, so we've had a kind of interesting experiment. We've had a 30-year experiment in much more neoliberal economic policy. And I think it's interesting to see what that's done for us. And kind of exhibit A, because I was talking about uh, the importance of energy innovation in the context of climate change, I show these shocking graphs. So this graph here, so this is government R&D in energy since 1980 to 2010. And you can see that uh, it's a universal phenomenon. The only slight exception is perhaps Japan. But uh, through the years of the decade of 1990 and 2000, energy innovation essentially collapsed across the, 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 the developed world. Uh, why did this happen? I think it's happened because energy markets were liberalized. Uh, this uh, data here is for specifically USA, this shows both public and private sector uh, energy r and I don't have the, the private sector data for but I can tell you that in 2005, the, the, the total amount of industry R&D in all utilities, including uh, energy and water, was 15 million pounds, which is a sum that's uh, utterly derisive. So you can see that we had, uh, in this case, in the USA, uh, actually in cash terms, uh, energy R&D carried on at a the lowish value that had come after um, the, 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 the early 80s. But all that time, uh, private sector r and uh, fell down. So what does drive investment in innovation in the neoliberal the economies? Here I turn to uh, the, uh, a fantastic authority on all things to do with modern culture. That is the onion. Uh, Recession-plagued nations want new problem for investing. Uh, Many things, uh, satire of course is uh, funny because it's true. It's a great book by Phil Janeway, who's a, 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 a very um, well-known uh, venture capitalist in the USA, and wrote his book, Doing Capitalism in the Innovation Economy, which is a fantastic first-hand description of how uh, the IT economy worked. And, and, and his point is essentially the IT economy was built on a combination of speculative bubbles and uh, government investment. And I think uh, there's a great paper by uh, Monica Gisler and Didier Solnet, which uh, extends this idea of a bubble to technoscience. So uh, the, it, this was a study of um, the, the Human Genome Project. And the, the argument here is the Human Genome Project itself was a social bubble, which is a set of reinforcing feedbacks led to widespread endorsement, extraordinary commitment to those involved. So here's my handy guide to spotting technoscience bubbles. They start with genuinely interesting science. All, all of these things don't come from nowhere. Uh, the first thing you have is something like this. We mustn't be left behind in this global race. So you get appeals to kind of techno-nationalist appeals for special funding <coughs> uh, It's the next industrial revolution. How many times have you ever seen a slide saying it's the next industrial revolution? Uh, Essentially, four short timelines to predict the transformation of society impacts. Uh, it'll be an N billion dollar market where N is going to be 10. Generally, 10 is the minimum going rate, isn't it, for one of these? Uh, so, um, yeah, what, what one finds a kind of flock of consultants wandering around trying to uh, kind of uh, inflate some kind of financial bubble to get their technology startups funded. And of course, then we have it could lead to the end of the world as we know it. They all have existential, this is where this existential risk discourse comes in. So I come back to the original question, in whose interest was it ever to go around to talk about Grey Goo? Actually, it wasn't somebody's interest. And there's a great paper by Alfred Norton, which is, I think, me enormously, in which he argues that this business of saying, you know, the speculative techno ethics, I talked about nano ethics, really, it, it, it's a tool in building 
up this, this problem because if, 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 you know, if technology isn't going to lead to the end of the world, it can't be that powerful. Uh, so I'll leave you to fill in your gaps about what you think current techno science problems are, which ones we've had. I mean, one could think about plant tech, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, graphene, artificial intelligence, really the really best. Uh, check them out against the checklist. So, to stagnation. It, I think 1940 to 1980 were the golden years of technological progress. So this is a, from uh, the economist Robert Gordon, this is the total factor productivity by decade. And you see this great wave of growth from the 30s to, 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 to the 70s. So I, I think um, you know, we see this now. Uh, economic growth rates have, uh, are not as high as they were in those, uh, those years. And one of the people who expressed a kind of frustration at this Interestingly, was actually a uh, you know an ICT entrepreneur himself. Peter Thiel said, you know, we wanted flying cars, and said we got 140 characters. And I want to kind of examine this. This, this. this is interesting. I think we can understand what's going on here by separating out three realms of innovation. We've got a digital realm in which innovation is easy, a material realm in which innovation is harder and a biological realm in which innovation is yet harder still. So what you need for innovation in the digital realm is this. It's the nice thing about Twitter. At one point, the entire early Twitter service was running on Lassie's laptop, which was an IBM thing. So you can build monster businesses with a handful of engineers and some low-cost hardware. Of course, what you have as well is a gigantic pre-existing material base of hardware and software, which has been developed through decades of public and private R&D. Uh, Mario and Max Carlton's books, a great uh, way that, you know, that, that uh, makes that very clear. Then the material realm, though, for big advances in chemicals, materials, energy, electronics, you need sustained long term <coughs> investment in capital and people, which is, in short, that social innovation that's called RD. And I would argue between 1871 and 1991, this was motivated as much by state power as by the need for economic growth. And my example, to go back to the Harvard-Bosch process, the amazing thing about the Harvard-Bosch process, it cost $100 million in 1919 prices to commercialize the Harvard-Bosch process. So uh, you know, how you do that conversion, that's a you know, billion dollars in current money, that was a share of the economy at the time, that's about $19 billion. I just want to stress, um, and half of that came from the German government. Why? Because if you could fix nitrogen, you could make explosives. So, this was the world-changing discovery of the, the, uh, the 20th century. It took sustained effort. Innovation in the biological realm is even more difficult because organisms essentially have their own agency, they fight back, and in some important areas we can see that innovation is slowing down so much it's unaffordable. Here's a plot of how many drugs you get per billion dollars. Uh, it's a fantastic exponential decay. This is inverse Moore's law. So uh, as time has gone on, it's cost more and more. So we're down here, we, we crossed a billion dollar mark in 2000. 2000, it, you, you couldn't get a drug, for, it took you a billion dollars to get a new drug. Now it takes you, it takes you four or five. So, uh, where does this leave us? I just want to put, uh, I, I am a scientist, so I have to put the scientist plot in this, the one plot that connects me to my actual day job. If you think about how, how's optimization done, we often depict optimization graphically as you know, progress through a landscape. In this case, it's a protein folding problem. This is how proteins fold. They have to try and try out lots of configurations. And if it lowers their energy, they stick back and carry on down. The trouble is the landscapes are not smooth funnels where you just roll down. A typical landscape for a complex problem, protein folding is a complex problem, Most, many other things are complex problems too is that you have this rugged landscape, and if you just try to roll down here, you get stuck in one of those holes. So if we take the, the uh, just in general, if you want to optimize anything in a complex landscape, you need to make big jumps, just rolling down a hill won't do. So if you argue that technological change is essentially an evolutionary process, you need to put those big jumps in, because the market won't deliver that optimization. And of course, this is not a new insight. Uh, so Joseph Schumpeter, and capitalism socialism, Democracy wrote this. Any system, economic or otherwise, at every point in time, 
probably utilising this possibility to the best advantage may yet in the long run be inferior to a system that does so at no given point in time because the latter's failure to do so may be a condition for the level up of speed at one month performance. So we need to get some big stuff done. We need to do innovations that decarbonise the world energy economy, adapt to climate change, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, contribute to the health and welfare of this growing and ageing world population. I'd argue that you know, the, the more we get to a kind of Hayekian neoliberal world, the less that that works. So that's my argument about why we actually still, well, uh, why we can't move this to, 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 to the market. Powerful though that is, is an idea for aggregating information. I don't really want to go back to a Cold War. I'm not enormously enamored by the idea of leaving it to the whims of oligarchs either. So if, if, um, if the nation is left by who's going to buy the suborbital flight. I don't think that's going to be the way that it uh, will be satisfactorily given this responsible innovation. So there you are. That's what I think, I think we need. Responsibly directed, large-scale, collective innovation. And how we get that, I, I don't know. I think that's our task. So I am concluding now. There are many dimensions of responsibility. The responsible practice of science. There's responsibility about its potential consequences, health and environmental. Uh, there's responsibility about the visions that we have of the future, of whether they're actually sensible or, or, or achievable or not. I think there's res responsibility about what are the real issues that society is facing and what the appropriate responses might be. I think uh, we need to be responsible in our salesmanship. So that we need to uh, be, you know, as scientists, how we talk to governments and funding agencies. Uh, and this responsibility, I think, as people trying to raise money on the markets to investors and indeed to the public. So, to absolutely finish, I try to keep these two ideas in play throughout the talk. I think it's irresponsible to innovate without a reflexive process of alignment with these widely held societal priorities. But I think it's irresponsible not to innovate in the face of the pressing societal challenges that we have. And to end with kind of note of despair really, well, of uncertainty. It's not obvious to me that our political economy is currently in a state that can help us provide that, and I'm not quite sure what we need to do to get to that state. Thanks very much. I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, Melanie Smallman, to uh, offer a, a few words of, of commentary. I'm conscious that I'm between you and wine, so I'll keep it um, to three points. I just want to thank Richard, first of all, for a really stimulating and interesting um, talk this evening. And for us in the Responsible Research and Innovation team here at UCL, it's particularly important that we've got a working research scientist saying this. Um, we've spent today in a workshop with our toolkit stakeholders talking about you know, what we need to do to embed this and making sure that this is part of research and not something which is done to researchers is one of the really, really key messages coming out of that. So thank you for being engaged with it. Um, I don't think I'm going to disagree with much of what Richard said. I just want to maybe build on a few of the points and perhaps press a bit further. I think that if anyone saw yesterday's headlines about the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's latest report just shows how high the stakes actually are for science and to me this is another reason why we need responsible research and innovation. So my first point is about um, Richard's point about how difficult it is to predict the future and I think that I can add to some of, of what's said. So a lot of the quotes that people use about why we're predicting the future and you know where we've gone wrong, they were mostly said at times before I was even born. Um, one thing that science and technology studies has managed to do in the last 30 years is to build our understanding of how um, innovation, technology and science doesn't develop along a path of its own. It is not independent of human influence. We, we build the world we want and we use science and technology to do that is very much a reflection of our values as a society. And actually trying to understand a bit more about how that works and how we can work that um, seems to be a really valuable contribution that both science and technology studies and this new field of responsible research and innovation could contribute. Um, I was also interested in, in the, the, the latest slides about dimensions of responsibility. 
And a lot of the conversations I've had with scientists and, and the stakeholders over the last few months have reminded me, somebody came up with a really good analogy, and I can't remember who it is, about um, a good neighbour. So responsible research is about like being a good neighbour, that you wouldn't create a load of rubbish in your house and chuck it out on the street and expect someone else to clear it up. Nor, as a scientist, should you be creating a lot of problems and then expecting society to clean them up, which I think is a really helpful analogy. But actually, to me, it's more than that. It's not just doing no harm, which is something that some people have suggested should be kind of a thing that we do with um, our right. To me, it seems to be about asking, do we have a duty to do good? So how can we not avoid harm, but actively pursue social goods and help people <coughs> with science innovation. And that's not necessarily given. I mean, anyone who's on the cycle mailing list in the past year would have seen that there was quite a heated debate about who said that we're here to do social good as scientists. Um, and then I think, I mean, my last point really is just, I'm, I'm so happy that you men mentioned the harm process because um, that's a topic that I really, really like to talk about quite a lot. Um, I won't, but I'll just touch on it. I mean, because I think the stakes are super, super high for science in this. When um, we hear the rhetoric of governments, and to be fair, the scientific community, about how science will tackle climate change, how it will, you know, we have to have more innovation because it's climate change, we've got an aging population, we've got people becoming obese. Well, the reason I like talking about the Harvard process is that when I was a teenager, I read a book about the Harvard process. That's the kind of teenager I was. And what made me interested in being a scientist was that there was a fact that a quarter of the world's energy in 1974 went into making and transporting fertilizer around the world. This is something which bacteria in roots of plants do on its own. And I studied microbiology at university because I thought that was amazing and that's what I wanted to do. I wasn't a teenager in 1974, but it wasn't much after that, yet we're still saying that science can solve this very same problem, and I'm quite a grown-up adult now. So um, there is an urgency, and I think the stakes are high, and if we don't get this right, then we will be left with the situation that we're currently in, where we're seriously contemplating quite dramatic changes in lifestyle, because there are technological solutions to some of the problems ahead. So, I mean, I think it would be a huge tragedy. I think that the transformational power of science and innovation is so huge that it has to be centre stage with the challenges we face. But I think that part of the role of responsible research and innovation is to push that forward to make sure that we're not just keeping our fingers crossed and hoping that a cure for climate change will be the next Teflon. Please do stick around for a drink and carry on the conversation, but in the meantime, just join me in thanking Richard Jones.